going to talk about vaccines, some of the diseases we vaccinate, and then uh, some of the problems we run into occasionally. So, so there's a lot of issues involved in uh, infectious disease in horses. Um, I used to do this for a living. That was not me, but I have been in that precarious situation. So it's not only a rough ride for horses, but it is for the owners of the horses as well. So a lot depends on what particular disease, obviously, they're exposed to how many horses there are in the area. If you've just got a couple horses in your backyard, you're at pretty low risk of coming down with, you know, without an issue. But if you're, if you're hauling extensively and a lot of horses in a, in a boarding facility, your, your risk gets ramped up. Uh, movement in and out, obviously vaccination history, and whether it's current vaccination history and proper vaccination history. Uh, horses are just like people. Some have a very good immune response and good, good levels of uh, natural immunity or innate immunity. Some have crappy. And then there's good old luck or lack of. So the animal has to help you have a functioning immune response. They have to be able to respond to the either disease that they're presented with and be able to fight it off or the vaccine that you're giving it to them before the period. Uh, the horse has to take an active part in this. So they have to have, you know, be on a good plane of nutrition, um, relatively low levels of parasites. Because as Ella uh, eloquently said, there's you know, a lot of protein losing diseases with these parasitic infections and antibodies which are formed after uh, vaccination are proteins. So you need a good level of, of proteins in there. There's obviously a time lag after vaccination. So you couldn't expect to vaccinate your horse, you know, one day and within two or three days have a really good level of, of exposure. So you really want to time your level of vaccinations between the risk of the disease and also the risk of when your horse is going to be exposed to, uh, to other horses around. Uh, there's booster doses required for just about all the vaccines out there. And so that's something your veterinarian will talk to you if you're starting out a, either a new horse with an unknown vaccination history or if it's a foal or a weanling you're bringing along. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be able to guide you through that process. Uh, if it's a mare, the colostrum that uh, she produces that the foal suckles uh, can interfere somewhat with the immune response. So that's one of the big reasons we don't start vaccinating foals at you know, two or three or four months of age. Generally, we wait till about five or six months of age with that. And then uh, not all animals respond the same, just like not all people respond the same. Okay. So the AAEP, which uh, the ladies at the clinic belong to and Wayne belongs to, uh, and most equine veterinarians belong to, has been a big help in coming up with some vaccine guidelines for veterinarians. And uh, if you just Google AAEP, which stands for the American Association of Equine Practitioners, their website will come up. And then there's a search engine that you can just put in there for vaccination, uh, vaccination guidelines. And, and it's pretty extensive. I've got a few of the slides I'll show you tonight. I'm not going to go over them at all in detail. But they have a, a group of board certified experts uh, in North America that sit down annually and go over vaccine guidelines for different types of horses, and it's been a real, uh, it's been a real uh, assistance to the practicing vet out there. Okay. So here's their, they've de decided what uh, is gonna be called core vaccines, and we'll talk about those a little tonight. Um, but these are the ones they've picked out that are of prime importance. A lot of these are because they're, uh, uh, most of these are deadly to the horse, and they also have some public health implications. Um, all those diseases people can come down with and all those diseases can kill people if they're in the right, uh, right or the wrong circumstance. So, okay. so here's the main diseases we vaccinate against in Canada in no real order of importance. Um, some of these are certainly regional diseases. Uh, I've never vaccinated a horse in my life for rabies, but if I was a practitioner in Ontario, I would be very busy vaccinating horses for rabies. Just about all horses get vaccinated there. Saskatchewan, quite a few horses get vaccinated for rabies there as well. BC and Alberta, uh, very rarely unless your horse is traveling into a rabies endemic or a rabies um, positive area. But a lot of these other ones, you know, you can kind of mix, mix and match. And we'll, we'll talk about these briefly as to some of the diseases that, uh, that are important more so than others. This is a picture of a friend of mine in a ranch down near Longview, Alberta. And uh, this is really big ranch country. These guys get together once a year at the different brandings, and they usually bring about two or three horses each. And these horses typically aren't vaccinated for anything. The odd one will get maybe an EWT West Nile, but typically, I would say most of them haven't been getting anything. Um, there's usually about 30 or 40 horses show up at these brandings, and they kind of mingle around each other. They drink out of a common water tank. Um, 
really, you know, wide open, vast country, very low risk of coming down with disease, but the year after I snapped this picture, uh, they had a really, it's the, it's the biggest outbreak of uh, influenza I've ever seen in a group of horses. These horses were extremely sick, um, you know, just a rip-roaring pneumonia, a lot of them got post, and it was just a real eye-opener to me and, and, and a bunch of these cowboys down in this area as to what can happen with, when you get a group of naive horses that you would consider, you know, they don't really go anywhere just to these brandings over a period of about a month. But obviously one of the young horses was incubating influenza and it spread to the others. So uh, even in a group of supposedly not at risk horses, you can see something like this develop. Okay. So there's some diseases that are life threatening, they will kill your horse. Not all of these will acutely, but uh, some of them sure can. Some are what we call a zoonosis, so they affect both man and animal. Some diseases are more debilitating, don't necessarily kill the horse, but cause some certainly disease. So influenza, uh, EHV is equine herpes virus or, or rhino, strangles, and then some diseases will abort pregnant mares quite nicely too, herpes again. Our friends in Ontario hadn't seen eastern equine encephalitis uh, for quite a few years and it really raised its ugly head here last year down there. And this also happened down in the eastern states. They had dozens and dozens of cases of a lot of the states supported Canada and uh, multiple horses dying. And when they did the, you know, when they worked through the outbreak of that, they found a lot of these horses hadn't been vaccinated at all or hadn't had the proper series of booster dosers as, as per label. So again, it was a very good eye opener to, uh, to the veterinarians there about being diligent with vaccines. The public health people started doing some survey, and they did this here in Alberta and Saskatchewan when West Nile virus was going. Most of these diseases are spread by, uh, by mosquitoes, certainly the two sleeping sicknesses, E and We and West Nile, and uh, they overwinter, the virus overwinters in birds. Mosquitoes start feeding on them in spring through summer. Virus levels start ramping up, then they feed on the horse or they feed on the human and the disease goes to them that way. So they do start trapping mosquitoes in some certain locales. Uh, they can raise the awareness then and say, time for the people to protect yourselves and time for the people to protect their horses. Okay. So there's a lot of different vaccines and it's sure not up to me to decide which one's for you. That's again, a discussion you have with your veterinarian. They know your risk tolerance. They know what you do with your horses. They know how many horses you have. You know, the, the diseases, I guess, of importance from year to year. So they try to choose the ones that uh, have the different combinations. So it gets confusing, right? There's three-way vaccines and four-way vaccines and five-way vaccines and six-way vaccines. And, and some people, a four-way to one person is not a four-way to another person. So you really are best to leave it up to your veterinarian and, uh, and you can discuss with, uh, with them as to what, to what they want and what your horse does, needs. Our company has two lines of vaccines, um, Viterra and Calvenza. Viterra is the... Calvenza is just a flu rhino vaccine. Viterra, we have a lot of different combinations. You can see for eastern, western tetanus, same vaccine with West Nile, same vaccine with that's flu and a rhino. And then the Viterra Gold is the six-way vaccine, so it covers you pretty well for everything. But as I said, it's up to your veterinarian and you to decide which one is, is suitable. It's good to read the labels on, on all these, certainly your veterinarians do, and, it, and they give you some guidelines, right? They're not just there to bore you, they're there to tell you you can start vaccinating your horses at this, at this certain age, they tell you how to use it, where to administer it, the second dose in three to four weeks, and I'll know, one of my colleagues that works uh, for Bowringer down in Ontario, they were investigating a lot of these outbreaks of eastern encephalitis, and he said it was very, very common that horses, when they started on a vaccination program, for whatever reason, they only got one in year one. They never got the booster, as it says there, three to four weeks later. Year two, they may have got one. Year three, they may have got one. But if the horse never gets that second dose in year one, they're considered unprotected. So again, it's very important to know that and to write that down and have a record of that in your, in your immunization guidelines. Okay. So the OIE is a group, um, operates out of France and they come up with with guidelines and so this is how it's not just a drug company deciding to throw darts at a board and think well we'll put these different strains in there they have guidelines every year where they come out and they recommend and they talk about the different flu vaccines different flu viruses out there as to which to put into a into a vaccine so there is quite a bit of science on this and then the AAEP expert committee 
also looks at this and follows their guidelines too. And here's, a, here's something that really bores you. said, I don't know, they're all exciting little doggy pictures and nice stories Elle has. I have, a, I have a dendogram of flu viruses up here. This just shows you the family tree. So this is, uh, this is grandma in Kentucky way back here. Here's the, here's the Eurasian or the European side of the family. They kind of died off here, not much happening here. But this is branched out here now. So this is what I just want to show you here. So this is flu viruses in, in horses. So they have what they call a clade one, which is represented by this family here. It's an Ohio 03, so they named the virus just as in humans is where they found it in the year. And then there's a kissing cousin branch, clade two, and this is Richmond 07. So these are the strains that the OIE is saying should be in the current flu viruses or flu vaccines, and Viterra has that in, the, in, in, our, in our line of vaccines. So it's up to date. Here's the AAEP, what they're saying um, about core vaccines and why they're saying they're important. And uh, you know, this is just cut and paste right out of the AAEP website. They talk about some, how different diseases are transmitted. They talk about different fatality rates of the different diseases. So there really is some really good information for any of you that are infectious disease newbies or want to learn some more information on this. Okay. And so here's the guidelines. They've got these broken down for every different disease. And I'm not going to bore you with these. I just got them up here to show you what they do. So here's the guidelines for Eastern equine encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis. They talk about adult horses previously vaccinated, how to handle them. Adult horses previously unvaccinated. Pregnant mares previously vaccinated. <coughs> pregnant mares unvaccinated. And then they do the same for the foals. So they talk about foals from, from mares that were vaccinated foals from mares that were unvaccinated. So there's a wealth of information here for every different disease that, uh, that uh, there's a vaccine out there for. So West Nile, uh, it's here to stay, it goes up and down as most diseases do, but it's not one to, uh, it's not one to uh, poo poo or kind of not worry about. This does have large public health implications and this is why it hits the, the media usually every summer is because there's usually some people that get ill with this and there's the odd person that die. Horses that get this disease, most of them will either die or become a lawnmower, and uh, they're not much good for anything. It, it impairs them neurologically. The odd horse will come back, uh, but I personally have never seen one that came back that was fit enough to ride. Most of them, uh, most of them become a lawnmower, as I call it. They just go around there and they can stumble around and eat the grass. Okay. 2013, so the different provinces, this is a reportable disease in Canada, so the different provinces and the CFIA in Canada um, uh, tallies all the, all the numbers up uh, every year. So I just brought it from the last uh, three years here to show you kind of what's happened. So they had 2013, oh, just back there, the one if you would. Yeah, they had a total of 54 animals. And again, there's some strange ones, you know, alpacas. When I first saw that, I didn't even know alpacas got that, that thing. But uh, dogs occasionally get, get West Nile. But you can see here, the common theme in most years is Saskatchewan and Alberta are one in two for West Nile cases. That's a very common theme, okay? So that was 2013, here's 2014. Uh, they had 21 horses positive in Canada. And again, uh, here's Saskatchewan, uh, number one, Alberta, number two in number of cases. And these are, these are ones that have been 100% diagnosed positive. These aren't ones where your vet, like even if you folks had a horse that was West Nile positive, and one of your vets came up there and says, yeah, it sure looks like West Nile, you know, and, but you don't want to spend the money and do testing. Even though Kirby would have to report that as a possible West Nile, that wouldn't be reported here. It has to be 100% positive diagnosed confirmed West Nile. So this is probably just the very, very tip of the iceberg. Um, I threw one here, you can see what happened, any of you that remember back when it first started coming, 2003, 170 cases in, uh, uh, in Alberta, and here's what it's dropped us. So we had four last year, and here's the four places in, uh, in Alberta, so they're all kind of out east, Oyen, Ndiang is kind of up near that Stetler country, Airdrie and Drumheller. And when none of those were vaccinated when they did the, back, the history back on them. That's another typical thing. I've never, I've never yet, found a horse that was properly vaccinated that died of West Nile. I've been, I've been exposed to one that got the vaccinated year one, got vaccinated year two, and it ended up dying of West Nile about two months after it got the second vaccine, but it never did get the two vaccines year one like it was supposed to. So that's the only horse that, that I'm aware of. 
When does West Nile occur in Canada? Kind of from June 29th to October 5th. This is the peak, and it always peaks, you know, late summer. This is a late summer fall disease for horses and people. Um, so if you don't remember those dates, it's kind of from when you're drinking beer on Canada Day till you're putting the turkey in the oven Thanksgiving. That's the risk period for your horse. And there's different policy levels of risk from different years for the, for the number of cases. But most veterinarians um, start vaccinating for West Nile, you know, obviously in, in advance of mosquito season. So probably around Mayish or so would be a, a prime time to start getting your horses done for that. It's an evolving virus. Um, this has changed. Uh, the original one was called a West Nile uh, 1999. It's now changed to what they call it in 2002. And they think this is one of the reasons it began to spread more rapidly. Um, this is data from the uh, US, but you can see it's you know, multiple, uh, multiple deaths uh, in the US. And look at, look at the number of cases. You know, it was over 15,000 horses in those, in those really bad years before a vaccine came out. And, uh, and this was running rampant across uh, America and Canada, okay? So this is when this genetic change happened, and they think what it did is it, it shortened up the incubation period for the virus in mosquitoes. So, you know, a mosquito has to bite, a, bite an infected uh, wild bird, gets it in, and then it starts, it has to reproduce, just like you know, Ella showed with the larvae and the, and the parasites. There's a life cycle that occurs in the mosquito with the virus, when that life cycle gets shortened up, those mosquitoes become infective at a quicker time, so they can, they can again, bite more horses, bite more people, and, and get them going now. So it's virtually this new strain is 100% of the cases now. Okay? And again, this is just cut and paste from the, uh, from the AAEP talking about the different you know, infection. Case fatality rate, 33%. 40% of the horses that survive, these are the ones that I call the lawnmowers, right? They've got residual central nervous system, uh, central nervous system uh, deficits that most of them don't recover from. Yeah, look here, horses represent 97% of all reported non-human cases. So 3% fall into the alpacas and the occasional dog, okay? And then they've got guidelines, how you vaccinate horses for West Nile, again, previously vaccinated, previously unvaccinated. Um, the vaccine first became available, it's a conditionally licensed vaccine in 2001 um, and it, it changed the face of this disease incredibly for when people started using it, the cases just started disappearing. Um, the vaccines from all the different companies are still very effective. Um, um, I guess the big thing is just trying to stay diligent with getting the horses vaccinated. It's like anything, if people haven't seen something for a couple of years, they think, well gee, I haven't seen that for a couple of years, I don't know if I'll vaccinate. And then once you get a whole population of horses at risk again, the disease hasn't gone away. It's just that what is the risk to your horses? So. Um, herpes virus, we'll just go through these fairly quickly. So there's a whole bunch of different syndromes of herpes virus. It used to be it was just respiratory and abortion. The neurologic disease was a new wrinkle that started about five or six years ago and, and uh, causes uh, central nervous system um, syndromes in some horses and some horses certainly die. We've had it here in Alberta. Okay. It's more of an individual case basis. It's not widespread. Uh, there's some good information here. Uh, Davis Vet School at University of California, Davis is a researcher down there that's done a lot of really good uh, research. These horses have developed this kind of dog sitting behavior. That's certainly not not common in a horse unless it's a circus horse. I, I, don't, I know my horses don't dog sit on command. They don't do anything on command, to be honest, <laughs> except eat. And here's some of the clinical signs that you would see different, you know, they don't get all of these at once, but there's a, a number of them. Um, these horses develop some head pressing behavior. Um, if it's a stallion or gelding, they, they dribble urine, their tail tone gets, uh, uh, gets pretty floppy. Um, they get very depressed, they run fevers. Um, they, they'll just stand there and look like a sawhorse stance in there. And some of them actually go down and they get that dog sitting position or some of them become recumbent and can't get up. Okay. And so there's some different, uh, you know, if, if people want to go to the extent, they'll try slinging these horses and, and getting them up. Um, to be honest, a lot of them, once they get to the neurologic stage, they're probably just euthanized. Okay. Many of you remember back in 2011, this was these group of horses that came back from Ogden, Utah, the, cut, the cutting horses. And uh, then they got kind of spreading it around to a few other, a few other cases. This became a reportable disease in Alberta at the time. 
And this was kind of the, the from the chief provincial veterinarian. They ended up with, uh, um, you know, four were asymptomatic, three had respiratory, three had neurologic scenes, four were positive um, suspect cases that also had neurologic. I think the next one has actually got the summary of them all. Yeah, so they had 14 horses reported, four in clinical symptoms, nine positive and nine in symptoms. There was one horse died out of this at the, at the end of the day. There was, but this was the one you hit the, remember the, it hit the front page of all the different papers and the news media. They shut down the High River Little Britches Rodeo for the first time ever. Um, they were just so worried about this disease getting going. But this disease is kind of a disease of hysteria. Uh, it's not something you really have to worry about going across a population of horses. It's kind of like a drive-by shooting. Northeast Calgary, right? It alarms you if you're living in Northeast Calgary, but otherwise you probably don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, there's no vaccines other than are, that have a, a label claim for neurologic herpes. So again, the AAP's got some good information on this. A lot of this is biosecurity because there is no guaranteed vaccine protection on that. So a lot of it is trying to, you do things right and you do things right for your horse. Um, they could talk about you know, how long it's viable for up to seven days. They talk about cleaning. You know, a lot of this is just good old sanitation and keeping your horse away from other, uh, um, from other horses and water buckets, especially if you're at a show or a, an event. Okay. And they talk about how long can your horse shed and uh, how many days to keep it away from other horses. Um, originally, they were thinking up to 21 days, but now they just they just changed that here and over the last year up to 28 days post-infection from a suspect. So good old conventional herpes virus vaccination, most of these are combined with a flu vaccine, as, you know, and then you can start building that to a five or a six-way vaccine. And it's like with most of the other vaccines, it's a couple doses, three to, three to four weeks apart. Uh, if it's a mare and you need abortion protection, you've got to use one of the vaccines that's labeled for that, and it'll, they need three doses for that. So vaccines, you know, just generally from all the different companies, they all contain virus strains. Um, some, of, some of the companies do a better job of updating, updating the vaccines than others. Uh, it's the same as on the human side. There's the adjuvant that's mixed in with it, and that's what presents the vaccine to the specific cells to create immunity and uh, tr tries to help develop to prolong immunity in the animal. And then there's also a preservative in there to uh, protect the integrity of the, uh, of the vaccine. By far the majority of the vaccines for horses are a killed virus vaccine, so they can't replicate. It's absolutely impossible for them to cause the disease, um, but they, give, they, they certainly give you a good level of protection against the disease. I've always said it's a good idea, unless you're really comfortable giving the vaccines yourself, is to have your veterinarian do them. They, you know, they will handle the vaccine properly from the time they get it from the uh, from the buying group that they buy their vaccines from, they store it properly, they handle it properly, they know the proper site on your horse to give it, um, the correct technique, and they also have some instructions as far as follow-up. So um, I know when I was working with Wayne down here, that was a you know busy part of our job in the spring, and I'm sure it still is now. We'd go around and vaccinate you know hundreds and hundreds of horses through the spring and, and early summer. The companies all have to do safety studies to look at the. Uh, uh, incidence of reactions and so this is I just showed you this and every company will have have data that they have to generate and uh, so after they have to do it after the first dose and after the second dose and with Viterra we had about 550 horses in each one and we had to look for with no clinical signs at all and this wasn't the company doing this this was outside group of veterinarians it'd be like we would contract equine services and they would maybe vaccinate 100 horses we contract another another vet clinic so it's all, it's all blinded and doesn't have any drug company tank in it uh, when the results are presented to the authorities. Okay. And then they score the lesions as far as if there's a minor one, a moderate one, or a major one. Um, five was, was considered a major, a major score. Uh, one was uh, one that you couldn't even hardly see. But you can see here, you know, 99% of the horses had no reactions after the first one. Um, there was only four out of 555. After the second dose, it was a little higher. 11 out of 555 had some reactions. And you see that every time you start vaccinating animals, the second or the third time, the animal, the body's been primed and has seen that vaccine before, and so you have a little, little bit higher risk of having a reaction after the second one. Okay. So you look at the incidence, the size, how long they're present, and they have to check uh, both uh, pre-vaccination 
and post-vaccination after both doses of the vaccine were administered. So when a normal vaccine response, this is the same thing that you know, the human physicians go through, I guess, when we go in to get vaccinated. Um, most times you see nothing. You know, that's the common response. Most times you see nothing. I get a flu shot every year. I've never had what I call a bad reaction. Most years I can tell if I push my arm the next day, I can tell I had a flu vaccine, but you know, it doesn't affect me from, from doing anything. But the odd person does have a, certainly a bad reaction, and the odd horse does too. Some horses are certainly mildly sore at the injection site the next day or for the first few days after. It's no difference than people when you get your, vac your vaccination. Some horses have a mild swelling at the injection site. Most of these will resolve within a few days without, you know, without doing anything other than just monitoring it. Some horses run a mild fever. Um, if you're taking the temperature, and I always encourage people to do that, if you think your horse is off the next day, take the temperature. And it's no different than, you know, as I said, the, the human physicians. There's a huge individual variable as to why some people react and why some horses react. And I wish I had a really good answer, but I don't. But when you should get alarmed, um, and I, I, you know, I just want a few important things here is if you get a shaking or twitching in the horse the first few hours post-vaccination, so this could be an anaphylaxis. It's extremely rare, a, a true anaphylaxis, but uh, this is where they're actually having, you know, some, some level of uh, um, adverse event that, uh, that should be looked at fairly quickly. But typically you'll see that where the eyes start snapping, you know, the horse may actually start tremoring or something. So certainly call your veterinarian if you see that. Those are very rare. Abnormal sweating. Some horses will sweat right at, the, right at the area of the injection. Some horses get lathered up maybe on their neck or coming down, coming down through the side um, of the ribs. Some horses within a day or two show very obvious signs of pain and discomfort. I mean, they're just holding their, their head out if they were in, in, injected in the neck and you can tell they're sore. And then some of them you can see these large these large painful swellings that this person here is trying to, you know, trying to get a handle on with the size of a, uh, a ruler. Okay. So what do you do if you, if you, if an issue, certainly call your veterinarian right off of it, because they'll be able to, you know, guide you through as to, is it minor, is it moderate, is it major, are you going to be able to handle on your own, or do you want, you want us to come out and have a look and, and, and help you, help you through this? Generally, there's nothing you're going to do that's, like, again, most of these, there's no real, life-threatening therapy you have to give to the horse or, or cure. A lot of it is just tincture of time and help with the horse through for the first few days. So typically we'll give the horse some bute. Your veterinarian will give the horse bute for the first few days. Um, they'll often have you do a cold compress or some cold water hosing at the, at the area for the first couple days and then maybe switch to uh, some uh, warm water or some warm pads after that. Um, bute does make a big difference for these horses for two to three days. Antihistamines, we have some horses just like some people that react every year to the vaccination and so I know some veterinarians have started recommending that uh, the horse gets a mild uh, antihistamine injection as well as a butte injection the, the day you're going to uh, vaccinate your horse. Your veterinarian may look at a different location on the horse to give it to so if the horse was re reactive on the neck and, and that was causing us concern with either riding it or the head coming up and down, they may want to go to the brisket area or even the, uh, the rump low down on the gluteals to try to get away from a problem area. And for sure, you know, this is really important. Vaccinate your horse well in advance of when you're gonna be using it. Every, it's, it I know people forget, you know, when you're going to a show and, damn, I gotta get my horse vaccinated. You know, that's always right. Murphy's alive and well when it comes to horse vaccines. It's always that horse that you've, you know, you would have normally gotten vaccinated a month before the show, and you get him vaccinated three days before the show, and he's the one that's gonna get a, sw a swollen neck. So, Try to, try to get these vaccines done in advance. In my last slide, yeah, just don't worry too much about it. it uh, they're, they're minor, they're an inconvenience, they certainly bother you, they bother your veterinarian, and they bother me when I get the calls too. We don't like to see them, but they are a fact of life, and, uh, and the, odd one does, the odd one does occur. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna kid you on that. But have a plan in place for your vaccines as to when you're gonna give them. Have a plan in place for your biosecurity whether it's at your place or whether you're on the road with your horse in the summer. And, uh, you know, like Mom said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure when it comes to keeping a lot of these nasty diseases away from your place. So that's it. Thank you.
17-year-old quarter horse Morgan that's reacted really badly in the last two years. Um, the first year, he actually collapsed after a five way And uh, the second year, he gave it to him in the chest. And he went paralyzed in the chest, so like in his front leg. Um, we've had three veterinarians look at him, and we cannot, they cannot come to a total diagnosis on him. Well, one person thinks that maybe he's actually allergic to the silicone tip needle, and that's triggering a bad reaction. Another one thinks he's clotting too quickly. Um, we're at a loss at what we should do. Should we? This year we didn't we didn't uh, immunize him at all. Yeah, no, that's what I was just thinking too, and I mean, that's a good point, is that some of those horses, you have to make the decision. I mean, vaccines are a risk-based decision, right? You're trying to, you're trying to, there's always a risk of giving a vaccine, and there's always a risk of not giving it. And in a case like that, where you've got a horse that's obviously something's going on, I'm, I don't know what it is, I'm not going to guess, but uh, I would probably make the same decision. A 17-year-old horse, he's got by pretty well as it is now, been vaccinated a number of years, I'd probably, certainly not vaccinate him every year. If you want to try it every three years or something, but, and maybe never. There's no sense, no sense causing some problems. Have you ever heard of that, of the silicone tip needles causing? No, reaction? I've never heard of that, no. Okay. No. I, I don't know if you can answer this question. Um, so there's a, a, a vaccine for horses for West Nile. Mm -hmm. Are they working on something for humans, or, or well, That's a great question. I, I asked my doctor that when I go to see him. <laughs> Yeah, so there's no there's no vaccine for humans for West Nile, which and I really don't know why that is, other than they just think that we're smart enough we can stay inside, put on some bug spray, try to stay away from the mosquitoes at the prime time of year where your poor old horse has to live out there and get bit by ten thousand of them a night in in June and July. But yeah, I can't I can't actually answer that if they are working on one. You would think they you would think they would. So when you say hives, they were just that had all those. We're talking like sometimes there's like five hives all over them. Like just one per horse or multiple per horse? Multiple per horse. You know, sometimes, I mean, some of those barns where you see, you know, because I've, Kirby, you've seen that too, we've talked about that, where sometimes you'll use one lot of vaccine and you'll go do barn A in the morning. You have no problems. You go to barn B and you'll have reactions with that. And it's the same lot number of vaccine. It's the same veterinarian giving that. So there's, I've often wondered if there's some sort of a sensitivity, whether it's a, something in the feed, and it's not that the feed is bad, but there's some sort of an allergen in the feed that's causing that. Or in some of those horses that react, if there's even just a kind of a low level of a dust or a pollen in the barn of that day of vaccinating, and when you put the needle in, you can't see it, but you put the needle through, and that just happens to carry that into the, into the muscular tube, but it's... Is we see that every year where veterinarians will go out and do a group of horses, there's nothing. Afternoon, they do another group of horses and they get some reactions there. So there's a whole lot of unknowns when it comes to equine vaccine reactions. I'll be the first to tell you that. Yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. So how much more combined? Logic tells you most, a lot of the immunologists think the horses are actually reacting to the edge of it. Not, not the antigen, so not the virus that's in there, it's the adjuvant that's mixed in with it. So then if you take that argument, and you agree with those people that are a lot smarter than me, that's what they tell you. If you're gonna, if you're gonna split that up and give a horse two needles, so one that has, let's say, EWT West Nile, it's got its adjuvant with it, and then you give it its flu rhino, it's got an adjuvant with it. So you just doubled the amount of adjuvant you're giving that horse, so you've just doubled the risk that they're gonna, that they're gonna have a reaction. So, I personally, I give my own horses a six away every year. I, none of my horses do. But again, I know some veterinarians that have, have had some issues some years with using multiple, you know, the six, the, the six way vaccines. So some veterinarians, not just because of that, but because of risk based decisions. So they'll try to give a flu rhino earlier in the year as you start using your horse. So let's say February or March. And then they'll come back in May and give them their EWT West Nile because that's just getting ahead of mosquito season there. Okay, we have to split her guy up, and so we do them one week at a time, yeah. and break it down as far as we can, he reacts less. 
React class, so yeah. You can no. get the feature and it's tied out with the No, and I continue doing that. I'm a big fan of if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Still reacting like that. Yeah. Yes. Annual shot. Right? Yeah. I don't, I've never had him given a booster shot, and I don't know if he ever had one before I got him. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, if, if it's not effective, like, so then in this spring, if you have this shot, you have a booster shot. You know what I mean? Yeah, so she's got a horse, and again, this is a common scenario, right? This is go back to what happened to these people in Ontario, where you've got a horse, and lots of times it's a horse you've obtained from somewhere, and they said, yeah, the shots are up to date, or you just gave them a vaccine the year one and then continued on. If you can't corroborate that that horse got two doses in year one, whatever year one was, I'd give them two doses this year. You're not going to cause any harm except for the extra cost of the vaccine. All that, yeah, all the vaccines that are the kill, kill virus vaccines have uh, have a two dose requirement. What's the Stragglers Kirby? Is it? It's two dose as well. Okay, it's not our vaccine. Yeah, rabies is a single. Okay, but yeah, flu, rhino, eastern, western, tetanus, west Nile, the common ones you vaccinate your horse with. Stragglers, two doses. Yep. That's probably a better idea out there, question for Kirby and the gals there, because I'm not there, obviously, when you do that. Stress in general, though, I mean, if you had a horse sweated up and worked up, yeah, it's going to increase his risk of having a reaction, especially if you're vaccinating through a wet neck. Just the fact that it's, you know, it's sweaty, you're going to be taking those proteins in with it. That's not going to help. But I don't know, Kirby, do you see that at all? I, I would I personally wouldn't say we see a significant difference in those horses. We do a lot both ways. and. The reactions that we see are pretty sporadic. You know, it doesn't seem to be associated with anything in particular. I mean, we can do a barn of 50 horses where we, you know, do them all in one day. It's definitely out of their normal realm of, of routine um, and, and don't get any reactions. And the next day we can do three horses and you get one that reacts. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure it plays a significant role other than, like Doug says, if they're really sweaty or wet or if it's a rainy day and the horses are all soaking wet, that's not ideal. So. All right, okay, well thanks Doug. Thank